Hello, everyone. My name is Kaya Mater, and I'm a publisher at Elsevier. I would like to welcome you to this webinar hosted by the journal NeuroImage, entitled Labeling and Confocal Imaging of Neurons in Thick Invertebrate Tissue Samples. Thank you very much to our sponsors at Bitplane for making this event possible. This webinar is part of the Bitplane When Size Matters series of lectures, which focus on new imaging techniques that enable researchers to study very large samples at cellular resolution. So far, we have covered optical projection tomography, light sheet microscopy, tissue clearing technique, clarity, and serial two -pho photon tomography. Before we begin, let me remind the audience that we will have a question and answer session following the presentations. Please submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Ask a Button, Ask a Question button on the right-hand side of your screen. I would encourage you to input questions as and when you think of them. These will be addressed in the Q&A session at the end. The more questions asked, the better the session will be. It is now my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's first speaker, Dr. Trevor Wardle. Dr. Wardle is a BBSRC David Phillips Fellow within the Department of Physiology, Development, and Neuroscience at the University of Cambridge. His research includes fly color and motion vision, imaging of neural activity, and recently, neural control of cephalopod skin. Without further hesitation, I would like to hand over to Dr. Wardle to begin his presentation. Thank you, Kaya, for, for introduction, and, and thank you very much to Blit Payne and everyone listening here uh, today. So uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the technique that actually uh, originated with uh, Paloma Gonzalez Bolito uh, in Howard Hughes Medical Institute in Janelia Farm. And it was really born out of necessity of, again, trying to image neurons in large tissue samples. And so for invertebrates, this can be, you know, several centimeters, not as big as vertebrate tissues, but nevertheless, still a challenge to image at multiple scales. And she was interested in looking at neurons in the ganglia of uh, dragonflies. So these are the meso and metaganglia you can see there on the front slide with some neurons labeled. And uh, these are the neurons that control uh, the outputs from the wings. And we took this uh, protocol then uh, further and started to develop it for uh, cephalopod skin, and this was particularly to trace the neurons involved with controlling uh, the color and reflectivity of the skin. Uh, and this was at the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And since then, we've moved on together to uh, University of Cambridge, where we're further optimizing the technique uh, at the moment. So. Uh, why would you want to perform this protocol? Well, you've already seen from some of the previous talks of this series that clarity, uh, for example, where you want to resolve neurons at many scales. And so in this case, we're, we're wanting to resolve at the output level the boutons uh, all the way back to the cell bodies, and this may cover uh, up to several centimeters even in an invertebrate. Uh, and one of the things that has made this protocol possible is really the long working distance um, objectives uh, that came out at the time when we when we made this protocol, there was a multi immersion objective from Zeiss that allowed you to image uh, with oil immersion up to five hundred and seventy microns, which was you know quite uh, amazing at the time and and while we were writing the protocol, a scale few objective came out that uh, allowed you to image up to four millimeters uh, with scale clearing. Uh, not only that, there were previous techniques that are published to help improve signal for noise such as a uh, paper by Karen Mesk and colleagues showing that if you shifted the excitation and emission wavelengths into the further into the red, you could now get better signal to noise. And so we took advantage of that in this protocol. And finally, uh, different chemicals became available that would allow improvements to clearing. And for example, theodiethanol or TDE as shown in this little diagram here. And, and this was basically better than the previous sort of BAB clearing that had been used uh, actually for, for quite a few years. So uh, how do you deal with large tissue samples? And in the past, really, you had to section. Uh, and this is really quite tedious and creates a lot of damage in the interface between sections. And this really means that it's very challenging to reconstruct neurons that go between these interfaces of sections. Uh, other people also tried squashing, uh, and, and that's been published, but, but nowadays it's, it's not so acceptable. 
Uh, others flipped the tissue, the image from both sides, that is. Uh, but this can cause nonlinear deformation. So if the tissue structure changes or the position changes a lot when you flip it over, it can be very difficult for reconstruction. And then finally, uh, refractive index mismatch can, can also um, disrupt uh, reconstruction of neurons. And, and this is shown in this example uh, here where if you take an optical section through this ganglia, you can see that, uh, in fact, the shape is different. And, and this is both two reasons. One, it might be an objective that's used for air imaging a sample that's in a different refractive index, or it may be that the tissue itself has a different refractive index. And so one of the, the aims of, of a good clearing protocol is actually coping with this uh, change in refractive index. And so matching refractive index really is a key part. Uh, and so I found this paper that was by uh, Lou and et al. And uh, they could show here using Hilbert phase microscopy actual images of different refractive indices in different tissues. And so you can see here very clearly that different tissues have different refractive indices. And even more importantly, within the tissue, there's a lot of variability. Uh, and it's this problem that you want to fix with a, a good clearing protocol. And, and not only that, uh, there's also a lot of nonlinear scattering through the tissue and, and isotropy that will uh, be really tissue dependent. And so uh, you want the technique to be as universal as possible and be able to deal with all of these types of problems. And one way some researchers uh, actually at Janelia Farm have helped uh, solve this is looking at adaptive optic systems. And these work by actually changing the wavefront of light that goes through the microscope. So under normal conditions, just you can see in A, you can focus to a point very easily. But in B, when you've got a lot of uh, elements in the tissue that are de deflecting light and changing it because of differences in refractive index, now the, the wavefront doesn't focus at a nice sharp point. Uh, however, if you change the wavefront, then you can reconstruct this quite well. Um, the only difficulty here is adaptive optic systems are rather new. They're not in many multi-user facilities and they can be rather slow depending on um, how you're doing the system. So uh, we moved on to wanting to find a way to do this uh, easily. And it also relied on filling cells and labeling them because, uh, for example, dragonflies don't have genetic ways of labeling cells. So it relies on using things like Lucifer Yellow. And this was chosen really because it has a very low molecular weight, which means that it's less likely to block electrodes when you fill. Uh, it also is able to be uh, determined uh, whether the injections are good using a fluorescent stereo microscope while the sample is pre prepared and, and undergoing different types of electrophysiological recordings. And then importantly, there's conjugated antibodies that allow you to shift the excitation and emission wavelengths, so they're available. And, and, and nicely, too, is that the, uh, the actual uh, Lucifer yellow is foreign to invertebrate tissue. And this then means that you can um, have very little nonspecific labeling. And so you can have excellent signal to noise ratio. And, and lastly, sort of uh, plea, I guess, to anyone who's listening in that, that may be working on developing these markers, we really need smaller and, and multicolor versions of of these labels with similar properties uh, so that you can do labeling of different neurons in the same preparation uh, and process them in a similar way as we've done in the protocol. So uh, what are the benefits of the protocol? Before we go into you know, how it works, let's, let's talk about what might be good for some users. So uh, we use ethanol to dehydrate and rehydrate, and this is the process to remove lipids, uh, and so other Protocols you'll see out there use other chemicals, but we found this works pretty well. And as long as you don't uh, expose the tissue to air at any stage, then it doesn't deform or change the size of the tissue. And of course, it's very easy and safe to do uh, just requiring ethanol. Uh, you can do immunostaining uh, as part of the protocol, and that means that uh, you can get very good signals to noise by shifting labels, and you can also label other structures you're interested in. Uh, Theodiethanol, for example, was first used in stead microscopy, so that's uh, one of the reagents we're using for clearing. And it was really used because it's miscible with water, so you can match refractive indexes quite precisely and have the best chance at getting high resolution. 
Uh, Theodiaphanol as an antioxidant really preserves the fluorescence of most fluorophores, so that means it's very good for clearing with multiple labels uh, in tow. And uh, it's quite fast, so within a few hours you can clear samples that are uh, up to a millimetre thick that we've tried. Um, we haven't tried thicker because we haven't had samples that needed it. Uh, as far as um, the whole protocol, it enables the use of high numerical aperture objectives, and, and this means that you can collect ang angles of light much greater than sort of uh, more basic uh, objectives, and it means you can have better uh, signal to noise and, and consequently better images. And I say there's no specialised equipment. That's mainly because these multi-immersion lenses uh, that we use are now available in many multi-user facilities, but you do need a long working distance oil objective. That's, that's sort of a given. Um, so let's move on to some of the actual uh, results. So this uh, is some uh, meso and metaganglia from a dragonfly. And um, so uh, we're going to, Andrew's going to put in the video now. Uh, seems we have a little technical issue. Here we go. So uh, this is just the same ganglia labelled uh, in different ways. And hopefully it'll play for us now. And basically what you're seeing on the left is just a rendering of the outside of the ganglia. And you can see uh, as it turns around that uh, it has a very smooth surface. And so this indicates that there hasn't been any effects of dehydration or, or changing the shape. And then in the second uh, model, you can see turning around, this is a single cell fill of one of the neurons that control the output of the wings. And you can see that it's highly complex and filled right down to the very tiny boutons. And that's in red. And then the green is the trachea, uh, which is autofluorescence. And the blue is also autofluorescence, showing the outline of uh, the tissue. And then the final uh, particular um, rendering is of uh, warp tissue of, of multiple neurons that have been put together so that you can look at the comparison and the morphology. And this was really the aim of what Paloma was working on uh, at Genelo Farm. So now if we move on to the next slide, uh, we can look at what we did with cephalopod tissue. And in this case, we first started with just clearing because we weren't sure that we could even clear the tissue uh, effectively because Dermal tissue in general uh, is extremely difficult. In fact, it's probably the most difficult tissue to clear because it has a lot of elements built in. And uh, so uh, we just thought we'd have a go at it first. And, and the first attempt was quite impressive, we thought, because it removed all of the uh, things that were in the tissue that have high refractive index out of the way. And so as you can see here, we're moving through the chromatophore layer, which is the pigmented uh, sacs in uh, a squid and they are pulled by muscle. So that's the radial structures you see moving away from each of them. And we could actually now determine how some of these large chromatophores operate uh, mechanically by seeing the structures and how anchoring works. So this was quite a useful technique uh, scientifically to look at the tissue. But now if we move on to the next slide, um, you can see uh, how we could now start to trace neurons in cephalopod tissue. And so this stack is actually a 500 micron high uh, stack uh, from, a, again, squid skin. And it's moving from the dermis and will go deeper into the layers. And so I'll just sort of demonstrate how that looks. There's a lot of connective tissue at the top here. Then there's quite a thick hyaline layer, which is sort of a protective layer for squid. And then eventually we'll get down to the chromatophore layer. These are these mechanical pigment cells. And then some neurons labeled in red and, and iridescent cells beneath them. Uh, and so I'll just play that again. But you can see that as you go through the tissue, there's a lot of changes in brightness due to autofluorescence uh, from the tissue. And this really in increases the difficulty of setting up all the imaging uh, to optimise uh, for the brightness so you don't saturate. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that uh, as we go through. So let's, let's move on to the next slide. So 
So here's just some example uh, images from that same stack, but it, it really demonstrates how much detail you can get from this technique by clearing and matching the refractive indices. You can see uh, here, if I move the pointer, you can see this very fine structure. This is part of an iridescent cell, and you can see the very small platelets within it. Uh, and then as you get deeper, you can continue to see these uh, very fine structures, and you can even see on some of our tissue the neurons that are innervating these radial muscles uh, around the edge of this large chromatophore. Uh, and then further down, you can see now very clearly um, you know, the axons that we've filled with loosely yellow and shifted to the red. And then again, you can see these iridescent cells and the very small platelets that are within them. So uh, we could get very good details quite deep into the tissue. And then if you've got a lot of time available on the confocal, we did very large scans. And this was really to get an understanding of the tissue and how everything's laid out. But it also is a wonderful demonstration of how complex tissue can still be cleared and imaged. Uh, and then if you go deeper in the tissue, you can now see where the neural, um, where the nerves and the very small neurons are controlling each of these elements within the, the tissue. Uh, and so finally we moved on to sort of the ultimate challenge, and this was uh, a tissue sample from cuttlefish or sepia officinalis. Uh, and these animals are very fast at changing their coloration and patterning uh, for camouflage, and the tissue is very densely packed, so it's about threefold more dense in the chromatophores. That's these colored dots that they have there. And they also have all sorts of white structures that are actually packed with highly refractive index um, molecules and so it's sort of the worst case scenario of trying to image but nevertheless you can see here this is an optical cross-section through a piece of tissue and we get through fair ways down until we hit these highly refractive um, uh, structures in the tissue but nevertheless we we moved on and tried some labeling in this dense tissue and you can see here very clearly that you can label specifically the neural structures in the tissue and, and not only that, you, we start to get an appreciation. You can see here some, some blood vessels that um, help keep the skin healthy because it's highly dynamic. Uh, and then you can start to see how the muscles that control these chromatophores are then anchored in the tissue as well. So uh, we learn a lot from, from producing these images, not just uh, understanding how clearing works. And so let's talk a little bit more now going through the protocol of some of the important stages. Uh, so for dye filling, you can either do uh, intracellular dye filling or extracellular, depending on what uh, you're interested in. But for intracellular, you prepare the electrode with the loose fialo in it and then do your normal intracellular recording process. And then when you want to label the cell, you uh, just inject with an oscillating sine wave of current. Uh, to introduce the dye into the cell. And within about two minutes, the dye should start to be visible under fluorescent light. And, and I should make a note here, for loose for yellow, you should always keep the light off and just periodically look at it because it can make the cells quite sick due to phototoxicity of uh, exciting the loose for yellow. Uh, but nevertheless, after about 30 minutes, uh, you can have very good fills. And for some more complex neurons, you may have to go out to two hours. Uh, but it's important here that the resting potential is monitored so that, so that you're holding the cell the whole time and not leaking loose for yellow into the, the ganglia of interest. Uh, if you're more interested in doing extracellular fills, then here it's a little different. You have to do the normal procedure of extracellular stimulation and recording, and then uh, you need to recut the nerve. And the reason being is that the nerve will heal up with time, and so we need to recut it so that the dye can start to enter the uh, the axons uh, very well and importantly once you've recut it you need to get it back into the glass electrode very quickly with suction and make sure it fits, it has a tight fit and then rapidly backfill with loose fialo so it can start to be uh, diffused down into the axons uh, and be transported and, and really after about 20 minutes you can see it quite clearly moving along uh, large nerves. Uh, the main difference here is that you actually have to wait much longer. And, and generally that's because you're feeling a lot of nerves and some of them, uh, some of the axons may be quite small. And so we feel for about a minimum of 10 hours. 
This makes a challenge for keeping the tissue healthy. So for this, we use a recirculating perfusion bath. Uh, and for squid tissue, we have to keep it at about four degrees. Uh, and we do this um, with about five or six litres of perfusion so it keeps everything quite uh, healthy for a long time. So if we move on now to fixation, dehydration and permeation, uh, once you've finished doing your electrophysiology, we take the tissue samples out of the rig and put them into uh, a new dish where we can exchange the perfusion with 4% paraformaldehyde and then we leave it in fixative between 6 and 14 hours. And one thing I guess I have to stress, which we, I think we mentioned in the protocol, is that it's important to optimise this fixation process. So for your type of tissue, you need to know uh, whether it can handle room temperature or it has to be in the fridge and, and how well uh, the fixation is done. So if you overfix, you can potentially block a lot of um, antigen binding sites. And if you underfix, when you do the rest of the protocol, you can wash away a lot of proteins. So this is a quite a careful step where you need to optimise for your setup. Uh, and then, of course, you're removing the fixative and um, cutting out a piece of tissue and putting it in a multi-well plate is sort of the end of, every, of getting it prepared for processing. Uh, from there, we move on to a standard uh, exchange of solutions, and you can do this with a, you know, quite a coarse pipette, uh, and we just go through a dehydration in, in ethanol and a rehydration, uh, and, and we do this through many steps and for about 20 minutes. And this is important to make sure that you keep um, the tissue uh, in, in good shape um, and you're not doing any changes too quickly. And I really have to stress here that for the rest of the steps in this protocol, uh, they all require some orbital shaking and it's really critical that the tissue is not exposed to air at all. So when we change these solutions, we always leave enough solution to cover the tissue and then uh, you know, just take the excess off and then switch out to the next concentration. Um, and then the other step that we, we've introduced in the protocol is is permeating the tissue with collagenase and hyaluridase. And, and this is really because the ganglia and even the squid tissue has quite complex um, fibrous tissue around the outside of it, and so we want to kind of penetrate that a little bit so that it makes it easier to get the antibodies in and out of the tissue. Uh, and of course you need to wash a lot to get them out and block their activity. Uh, moving on to blocking and antibody labelling, uh, the importance here is that you block non-specific binding with, with uh, normal goat serum and incubate for two hours. And then for the antibody solutions, again we uh, use an, a universal antibody diluting solution. We found these to work very well for a range of antibodies uh, and, and makes things a bit simpler. And again, we, we only leave uh, enough solution in to cover the tissue and then add a more concentrated uh, primary antibody solution uh, to the mix so that we end up with about a 1 is to 200 uh, concentration. And, and that will be quite high to some people, but given that you're doing whole mounts of very large areas where there's potentially a lot of uh, binding sites, then you may need quite a lot. But again, I sort of stress here to optimise a little bit uh, because some tissues you, you may find that's too strong. Uh, we do our antibody labelling in the fridge on an all-bottle shaker and so the primary and secondary steps are both for three days. Uh, and, you know, we do blocking in between with normal goat serum. The other thing to mention here is uh, rather than a secondary antibody that uh, binds to the first, we actually have taken advantage of streptavin and biotin uh, binding here uh, and this can increase your signal a little and so where possible uh, I guess we, we sort of thought that that would be a good way to go. Um, the other important part that I've mentioned here is for each of the antibody uh, steps where you're labelling uh, or even doing secondaries where in the fridge we use an adhesive seal, this is a PCR type uh, top plate adhesive seal to, to keep all of the humidity in the in the chamber of each uh, multi-well uh, hole. That way, then uh, there's little chance of the tissue getting dehydrated, even on an orbital shaker for a long time. So, if we move on uh, to the last part, the clearing. In our case, this protocol is very simple. It's using 2,2-CO-diethanol uh, TDE 
This is quite uh, easily available from like Sigma and other companies. Acros Organics is one company we've used that's uh, quite affordable. So um, that's one place to get it from. And we go through a lot of steps with TDE. And the reason being is that, again, if you do this rapidly, you may change and or the, deform the tissue. Uh, but still, it can be done in, in half a day kind of thing. Uh, so that's, that's quite attractive. And then we mount in uh, what we call a custom metal slide, which is basically uh, a slide that's made of 600 uh, micron uh, stainless steel that's had a hole cut out of the centre of it. And then you can use a cover slip either side of that hole to mount your sample. And uh, important here is to make sure there's no bubbles when you mount it and to seal it up with uh, nail polish and harden. And these, these sort of simple things work still very well. Uh, and then finally, the confocal imaging, uh, it's essential to use a, a oil um, objective and, and um, that way you can match refractive indices across immersion, oil, uh, cover slip and sample and, and the solution in the sample. So just some sort of last considerations for the imaging uh, that I thought I'd bring up because they're quite specific to doing mosaic tile scanning for neural reconstruction. Uh, and so what we found is that the objectives, although they're really lovely, aren't precise right out to the edges. So you have to zoom down to uh, about 1.4x and set the tile overlap to a sort of generous 20%. And this then um, will make the field illumination more uniform and limit the effects of pin cushioning and barrel distortions. And, and this really then means you can get quite um, pretty images for publication. Of course, you could ignore all this to sort of just check out your tissue, um, but you will have these sort of artifacts there which are fairly difficult to correct uh, in some cases. The other thing which I'll highlight, which you know, many advanced confocal users don't need to, to sort of uh, be told, but uh, it's important that you set the offset power and gain settings uh, for each laser and um, detector so that uh, you use a sort of range indicator and make sure you're using the full range of, of the encoding of, of the data and that way uh, you can get the best quality images. And then I repeat this process again when you set up a tile scan area. This really is by eye because there's very little software that gives you sort of uh, real data across the whole tile scan area. Uh, but by eye is still very good because you, you look up table uh, will tell you. And then I repeat this again for each depth. Uh, so I do several depths that I set up. And you can save each of these depths into the software and then it will do a linear calculation that as you go through the Z stack, uh, it will calculate what the laser and gain or whatever settings are that you've set. And for example, Zeiss, Leica and uh, Nikon all have these built into their software. Uh, and probably many others, there, there's just a few that I've tried. Um, but they are really critical for tissues like skin where at each layer it may change a lot. You you normally increase the laser power with depth, but there may be points where it's very autofluorescent and you have to reduce the laser power during you know, maybe 20 or 50 microns and then increase again. Uh, and so these are quite handy tricks to, to have set up. Uh, and so uh, let's move on to compare this to a little bit of the other clearing methods. I'm by no means an expert in any of these. Uh, I'm only really talking about things I've spoken with others and, and looked at the protocols. But, but nevertheless, um, there's some really great ones out there. Uh, they've used things like THF to clear out lipids instead of, uh, instead of uh, the ethanol we've used. Scale has a whole range of reagents that are freely available and had you know, very large pieces of tissue cleared. However, it's taken quite a while, two weeks for a whole brain, and it also changed the tissue volume and really required uh, a specialized objective and, and in some cases a specialized confocal as well. So uh, there, there are drawbacks, but there are also really good um, benefits of using these techniques. Uh, CDB is much faster than scale uh, and has a whole lot of um, a, benefits of maintaining other types of labels like di eye, um, but again, specialized objectives. So, um, you know, this, this, this sort of gets uh, reiterated a few times here, but, but that's part of how these techniques 
uh, seem to be working. For clarity, uh, it's faster than scale but slower than CDB and uh, requires some specialised electrophoretic tissue clearing equipment, which, which there's a lot of information online you can set that up, but it's just an extra level of complexity that you know, you'd have to take into account. Clear T, uh, I don't know anyone doing that, but uh, it seems very fast and quite good, so uh, I guess watch this space for that one. Uh, and then the more recent techniques that have come out, um, like 3 disco using uh, uh, THF and dibenzyl ether, uh, and then an improvement on that uh, then adds some um, bleaching of with hydrogen peroxide, uh, and this will help reduce autofluorescence and, and improve immunolabeling. But also um, there was uh, a shift in excitation and emission wavelengths that we have done um, to help preserve the fluorophores because uh, they weren't so compatible with dibenzyl either. Uh, both of these uh, DISCO protocols uh, have refractive indices matched greater than oil, but an oil objective would probably work very well for both. Uh, and then finally, two uh, new ones. Cubic uh, actually has two papers in cell, uh, one that shows the reagents and the other one shows that you can actually clear whole organs and whole bodies. It's, it's very impressive. Um, and all of the reagents are easily obtainable and uh, you can get some very clear uh, tissue samples for very large uh, neural reconstruction. And then uh, the packed PARs and RIMS is sort of a version of clarity, uh, but now uses perfusion. So this probably isn't so applicable for invertebrate tissue, but I thought I'd sort of be sort of complete and add it in here. Um, and, and really both of these new protocols, uh, cubic and, and pack pars rims, both require specialized objectives, but, but and, um, you can get very large volumes. So that's really excellent. And so lastly, just to talk a little bit about new immersion objectives. Uh, here, uh, there's a whole bunch of competition, and so things are coming along uh, really good for neural reconstruction. Uh, so Zeiss have that objective that we used in the protocol, but since then they've come out with a scale objective that's very impressive with 5.6 millimeters working distance, but it does require a specialized upright microscope. Um, Leica's has come out with their own uh, objective uh, similar to the Zeiss multi-immersion with 0.68 millimeters working distance and also a very impressive clarity objective uh, of, of 6 millimeter working distance. And this particular objective has a motorized refractive index correction, uh, which, which seems unique, which you know, could be extremely advantage for, for tissue that varies in refractive index with depth. Uh, and then finally, Olympus has come out with um, uh, two what I would call you can sort of breakthrough objectives because uh, there's a 10x and a 25x, but they both have eight millimeters working distance, which is huge and they both have a large range of refractive indices that can be corrected for with a multi-immersion uh, collar. Um, so there's obviously a lot of engineering in these, uh, and, and consequently the price tag is, is quite uh, pricey. Uh, I asked for some prices, and, and they both came out at over £20,000. So, um, you know, they're specialised, but they will allow you to look at things you could never look at before, so that's really quite incredible. There's probably others in development, but this was sort of the best that I could find at the moment. Uh, so the sort of key learning objectives uh, from our protocol that we came out with is that uh, refractive index matching across immersion medium cover slip and cleared sample really gives you the best opportunity for, for best quality images and it negates the need for post-processing, warping and, and rescaling. Uh, Theodoethanol can really rapidly clear tissue and match refractive indices, and so you can use the best uh, highest numerical aperture oil immersion objectives, and shifting the excitation and emission spectrum um, of the antibody secondary labels really helps improve signal to noise, especially in invertebrate tissues because they seem to be quite uh, autofluorescent. So with that, I guess I acknowledge uh, Cold Spring Harbor for publishing our protocol, but also um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, Genelia Farm uh, for hosting Paloma uh, in Anthony Leonardo's lab and uh, various people from Genelia Farm that helped uh, in the first parts of the protocol in testing and for example Rob Erlberg and Andrea Worthington also uh, tested the protocol out for us who also work on dragonflies. 
Uh, and then when we went to the marine biological lab, uh, Roger Hanlon hosted us in his lab, uh, and we really have to thank the funding agencies who helped support him and the research that we were doing at the time. And a range of people there also were, were very generous with their time and, and helping with samples and testing the protocol on, on cephalopod tissue. Uh, and with that, I guess uh, I thank you all for listening. And I look forward to any questions you have later on, and uh, I'll pass you back to uh, Kaya. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Wardle, for your presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's second speaker, uh, Dieter Goldman. Dieter is a support manager at Bitplane. He completed his diploma thesis on neurogenetics and the axonal pathfinding in the optical lobe of Drosophila at the Albert Ludwig University in Freiburg, Germany. His work with Imaris started during his thesis and continued on in 1995 when he began selling Imaris in Germany. Since that time, he's been with Bitplane both in sales and as an image and analysis application specialist. So now if the presentation is ready, I would like to hand over to Dieter to begin his presentation. Thank you. Yeah, hello, this is Dieter from Germany speaking. Uh, Thanks a lot for these great, great images of Trevor Wardle. And I want to show you now what you can do with this kind of da uh, data in the bit planes of the IMARIS. So it's already opened here. What we see is one of these Dragonfly data sets, which were shown in the beginning of the presentation. So basically, I just want to show you based on the result which I got in IMARIS. So we have here the uh, one of the channels we constructed, so we have the outside of the uh, dragonfly as a reference. And then if we look inside, I open this clipping plane here so you can, you can look inside. We see inside we have the um, nerve uh, reconstructed as a, as a vector object. And that means with these vector objects you can answer questions like what are the lengths of the neuron, uh, how many branching points do I have, what are the diameters, and especially here one of the questions was um, how many of uh, first level side branches do we have uh, inside the whole data set. So th this is the result, so let me I show you uh, where we started from. So this is basically the, the original data set, which we got. It has uh, three channels, and um, the main channel of interest is the red one. So we have the blue channel, which we don't need now, and the green one here. And then we have the red channel, which shows the stained uh, nerve. If you have a closer look at this staining, uh, we see it's, it's really nice for such a big object. It's, it's beautiful, but still it has some challenges which you have to overcome when you do the uh, segmentation. So first we see in this area here, we have quite a lot of objects stained here as well, which are not directly part of the, of the nerve. So th those have to be excluded from the analysis. And um, if you look closer at the staining as well of the fibers, you see it's not completely continuous. So we have some gaps inside, and, um, but Ameris can handle this qu quite well. So this data set has uh, uh, two areas here. This area is, has a, is a little bit more challenging. It has these background uh, objects. And then if we move further, uh, we see uh, this area, it's quite, it's quite clear. So we don't have a lot of background. Um, and, but still, the, the, the punctuated staining is there and uh, overall the staining is a little bit weaker. So uh, to overcome these differences, uh, what I did, I, I did the reconstruction in two subregions. So first I did the, this subregion, and then I did that subregion, um, and tuned the parameters for the different regions a little bit, so we could get nice um, uh, uh, results, even with the automatic detection. And then in the end, I just joined these two vector objects, uh, which is quite easy. So I cannot show you the full um, 
preparation because this um, out of path method which we use here uh, takes a while to, to calculate, so that would, would go over time. Um, but uh, I want to show you a little bit uh, from the result. So just to mention the out of path, the idea is like this, that we have a starting area, uh, which is here. So we, we, um, we mark this with a point, and then the software will uh, mark the uh, boutons and, and the, the nerve fibers with the smaller butt, um, spots. And then these spots, the smaller spots, then are connected to the big spot by going through the most um, bright intensities of the data set. So with this way, this way we get a vector. And um, the, the raw result uh, will then be already quite well, but you would need to do some um, editing afterwards. So um, IMERS has as well a rich amount of, of editing tools and um, just show you what the, the first editing I had to do here was that directly at the main branch here is there's a lot of brightness going on. So we got some, I got some false positive um, small side branches and there are tools for instance here uh, where you can select branches depending on their length. Yes. Um, for instance, here I used the relative branch length um, tool, so it basically selects uh, branches which are shorter than a certain uh, uh, length, um, depending as well on the diameter of the branch they come up from. So in the end, it's, it's a little bit more sophisticated than just taking the length. It's just a, um, uh, a ratio as well, which depends on the diameter of the branch where they spring off. So this was uh, done then more general, so that basically that will select um, small branches on the full data set, and then in the end you just press delete and delete them all with one stroke. So this is quite uh, automatic. And now I want to show you as well a little bit um, what you can do with, with manual editing. Um, I didn't have to do too much, but a uh, few branches and uh, and uh, um, we're, we're still there, false positives, and a few ones which I had to enter, uh, add as well. So here, for instance, we have uh, one of the false positive branches, and so I can simply select this guy with my mouse. You see it's highlighted, and then you can delete it with a simple mouse click. So this is, of course, not, uh, not really challenging, selecting objects and then deleting them. A little bit more sophisticated is um, a tool to manually draw. So first I have to find the location where I have these, which is missing. Uh, here it is. So I'm not sure how good you can see this on the screens because of the, of the video, but um, maybe you see that here is a structure which is missing. So here, no, no staining is, and the staining is a little bit weak, and, and no um, branch was added by the software. So we see that in the beginning there is a short branch which we can use as a start, and then I want to draw the rest of this uh, manually. So for this I go to the drawing tab of, um, of this, um, filament tool, and there we have different drawing methods. Some are more automatic, some are more manual, um, because the automatic one will take as well, again, some, some calculation. I will just show you one which is fairly um, manual. This is the auto depth tool. So for this, I need, again, my, my 3D mouse. So we have this white little box, which I can position with my 2D mouse in the 3D environment. So this works. Um, like this that, the, that I positioned X and Y with my mouse, and the set position, so in depth, um, this will be calculated by the software. So first I select the, the beginning area, and then I press Shift, and I'll follow, uh, hopefully quite accurately, my fiber here. So again, X and Y is set by my mouse, and set is set, um, by software. Okay, and the last curve, that's, that it, that's it. So now it um, will insert um, the line, and uh, 
what you maybe see now that the line is slightly off because I just did this uh, not accurate enough and uh, there but there's some help from the software so you can switch back to the um, edit tab and then now I select my drawing will highlight and there is a tool which is called center so this will recenter the line to the brightest intensities which are in the surrounding so if you look close maybe you will see it if it snaps there so I press it uh, I have to tell them which channel I want to work on the first red channel I want to work and now it will snap it to the center so this is fine-tuned the next thing which you maybe notice is that the diameter is constant. So in principle, I could um, draw as well different dis uh, diameters by just resizing my um, drawing box here with the mouse wheel, but I didn't do this, I just draw. And what you, what you can do now is to calculate the diameter automatically by using the, the diameter tool. Okay, I just use the defaults here for the parameters which work in most cases, um, and now you see that this is resized. Okay, so that's um, basically done. This is what I want to show you for the reconstruction part. Um, and the next thing is that you now have, of course, a lot of statistics. Um, so for instance, if I, if I select here um, this part, and I go switch to the selection tool, you see that we get quite a, uh, a long list of, um, sorry, I deselected it, yeah, uh, a long list of uh, statistics, and there are even more in the software, it's not, not everything is activated now, but you get, for instance, information like um, what's the length, what's the diameter, uh, if you would have spines, for instance, we don't have it here, you would need, need see the number of spines and things like this. Um, so one question here which, which Trevor had about this data set was um, how many main side branches do we have on the neuron? So we have here, um, this one is, is level one, basically the big one, and then we have second level side branches which are uh, smaller ones which go again through, through the tissue here. Um, the software uh, is able to calculate this by using uh, um, a little extension. So uh, here on the Tools tab of um, the filament tracer, you will see uh, MATLAB programs. You can add here as well your own written programs, like in, in MATLAB or Python, for instance, or Java. Uh, here, these are um, programs which are delivered with Ameris. So what I can do now, if I select this and I press, uh, would press uh, branch hierarchy, the software would recalculate uh, the connection. So we will. It will send the topology and all the diameter information and so on to MATLAB. And in, in MATLAB, the, the, the tree structure would be recalculated in a way and resorted in a way that we get continuous um, side branches sorted by the level. So in the moment, for instance, this here, if I click on, on this, you see it's, it's little thick segments. And what we need for the count is the, just the complete um, the complete structure, the to complete second level as one branch. So if you click here, um, it would calculate. It's, again, it takes maybe one, two minutes. I don't want to do this now. I just show you the result. So the software, the MATLAB extension will feed back into Ameris the result, and, and this is shown here. Um, so it generates a subgroup, and in, inside this group we have different, uh, the different levels sorted. Uh, you see I can switch on and off the second level. And if you now go for the uh, count of the objects here, you will see this uh, 77 um, branches, side branches. So like this, you can enhance the software even further. Okay, that concludes my presentation, my short pre very short presentation of Ameris. Of course, there's much more to do in filament tracing, but um, maybe you can join us for another web, um, webinar if you're interested in, in more details. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dieter. Uh, that was a great presentation. And so now we're going to move to the uh, question uh, and answer section. 
Um, we have uh, about 10 minutes um, for the questions that have been coming in. Um, so I will read off the questions and then either Dieter or Trevor can answer them. Um, so here's the first question. I see that with higher quality imaging of thick samples, there is little need for manual alignment of sections. Therefore, are there any progresses made into real-time 3D reconstruction or tracking of individual neurons and synapses? Also, is there any progress in image acquisition in native 3D file formats, not just stacks? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, maybe Dita wants to answer the first bit, and I can have a go at the second bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so there was about real-time segmentation of, this, of the fibers. I'm, I'm not aware that there is any software which can do this real-time, um, for instance, during the acquisition or something like this. So, of course, the, the algorithms get better and faster every time, but real-time is not there. Um, and still, I think to get the perfect or very, very good um, segmentation, you will still need manual editing even in the next maybe five years, five years or so. That's my personal guess. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I tend to agree. There's, there's some software out there uh, that can allow you to do real-time control of the microscope, but of tracing neurons, I think that's still a challenge. And I, I think it's a lot of people focusing on that. Um, uh, Hanshuan Peng, uh, who, who we ended up collaborating with, works on that as well. Um, but there's a whole range of other people. Um, I, I would also say for the image formats, um, it tends to be in stacks anyway because that's how it's acquired. Um, there, there are only a few types of microscope that allow you to do multi-plane imaging simultaneously, and I think that will push the formats into that uh, 3D format. But uh, I think handling the data as a, as a TIFF stack, for example, still is quite uh, relevant. But that's just my feeling anyway. Okay, thank you. Second question. Are the depth the antibody penetrates the tissue and tissue fixation as important when doing confocal microscopy as important in invertebrates as in rodents? I mean, when doing Z-stacks on mouse neurons, you need a perfect fixation, and to choose neurons for Z-stacks that are closer to the surface of the tissue, is this the same for invertebrates, or does it not matter that much? Uh, I, I think it does matter. I, I don't know about perfect fixation. Uh, in, certainly in our hands for invertebrates, if you get it within a certain uh, sweet uh, window, so within a few hours and the right sort of concentration, of fixative and, and temperature for the tissue, then it tends to work quite well. The main issue with antibody staining is getting very specific antibodies, and that's very challenging in non-model invertebrates. Uh, and so that's probably much easier in vertebrates. I haven't worked in vertebrates, so I can't make that comparison. Uh, but, but definitely fixation is a key thing to optimize for getting good antibody labeling. Okay, here's another question for Dr. Wardle. For your imaging, what kind of light source did you use? What was the intensity? Ah, so all of it is with a confocal microscope with a range of lasers. So typically we use the 633 laser for uh, the particular loose yellow uh, secondary antibody. And higher would be better, but we didn't have a 647 available. And then we use lower wavelengths as autofluorescence. So we used a 405 laser and uh, I think a 514. Uh, sometimes we use 488. It just sort of depends. Um, the laser intensities are normally less than 50% at the bottom of the Z stack. So at the top, it might only be a couple of percent. Uh, and then when you get to the very bottom, it might be quite high. Uh, but that's OK for confocal uh, scanning. The only downside is that if you have it very, very high, then you will bleach your sample, which means you can only really image once or twice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. Which clearing method would you recommend for tissues that express GFP or TD tomato? Uh, so in our hands, we use theodiethanol to match refractive indices to get a good um, 
uh, image, and as far as I'm aware, it works very well for all the sort of GFP, TD, uh, uh, tomato-type labels. The only one it doesn't work that we're aware of is Phalloidin, uh, but most people, well, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of people don't use it. That's the only thing I would say. Okay. I think this question may have been answered, but one of the um, attendees wants to know, what is the imaging software used for the second part of the presentation, Peter? Yeah. That's a that's, um, software called Imeris uh, with, a, with, a, with a tool called Filament Tracer, and the company is Bitplane, which makes this. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question. Um, how long did the segmentation take you to get this result, both automatic and manual parts? Yeah, so it took about two, I would say, with this with the optimization of the parameters, it took me about two hours for the automatic part and about another three hours um, cleaning up the data set up to uh, the level we see it now. Okay. Uh, and then and the next question, can you count the number of N segments? Uh, yes, we can count this, the, the number of, of the uh, tips, basically, yeah. Um, so, um, the tips have, have a special, uh, belong to a special category, and you can count them, yes. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, does this technique work with every fluorophore? Uh, so that's, that was related to the previous question. Um, for the ones that we've used, uh, the general sort of Alexa and, and uh, other dyes, it works. The only one we're aware of it doesn't is phalloidin. Okay. Uh, next question. The method includes streptivin. Uh, does the streptivin have any unwanted side effects? Uh, so the answer is yes, it does, depending on your tissue. So you probably saw in the demonstration uh, from Bitplane that you could see some structures there that were labelled. Uh, and we, we think it may be mitochondria, but there is some non-specific labelling uh, there are some chemicals you can use to try and prevent that, but that also affected tissue structure. So, uh, as you saw, you can get overcome it by automated tracing, so we weren't too worried about it. Um, but, yeah, that, that's the only unwanted side effects, is there can be some slight uh, non-specific labelling. Okay. Uh, next question. There are many ETOH exchanges. Can we reduce them or reduce the time? Um, potentially, but uh, the, the difficulty here is uh, making sure that you can keep the tissue uh, in a good shape and size. So uh, we, we have tried, and in certain samples it does work, but uh, it's not a lot of time, and so in our case uh, we would prefer to do them all uh, and, and lose that time but know that our tissue is being well preserved, especially samples that were done for electrophysiology that were very difficult to, to get the electrophysiology result and then very difficult to get a good fill. Okay. Um, so we're running out of time for questions, but I just wanted to wrap up um, to say thank you for all for your participation and for submitting these excellent questions. Um, any questions that we were unable to answer today due to time constraints will be passed on to the speakers who will then try to contact you later for an, for an answer. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all speakers for their presentations and also to thank the attendees of today's webinar. This has been a very informative webinar with a lot of thoughtful questions and answers. Uh, a number of you had inquired about previous webinars, um, so f further information on the One Size Matters series of webinars can be found at www.bitplane.com forward slash sumo, S-U-M-O. Um, and here you can find recordings of previous re webinars, including today's talk. Um, so that concludes our presentation um, and the presentations for today's webinar. And I want to thank you all very much, and I hope you have a great day.